Hello and welcome back to another episode of Generation Films. My name is American Ben. Sorry for the lack of clothing going on here, but it's super hot in here and I can't run the air conditioning while I shoot a video. And also, if I don't wear a shirt, then it can't be wrinkled. Also, sorry everyone, I have to take a break from long-winded melodramatic expanse videos today in order to do a more general video in line with what Father Algorithm likes, but I promise we will be back to the expanse soon. Instead, today we are going to cover parasites in sci-fi. A suggestion inspired by an Instagram follower of ours named, um, I think, Lily no Hanataba. Lily, if you're out there and I butcher your name, I'm sorry, but the lack of spaces on social media really makes this difficult. Anyway, viruses are a no-go on YouTube right now, and plus we're already on thin ice because when the pandemic broke out, we kind of told people it was started by the Umbrella Corporation in order to create an army of zombies. But parasites should be in the clear. We can make up whatever we want about them, I think. But seriously, as someone who runs a YouTube channel that covers a lot of different sci-fi franchises, what you begin to realize is that there are a lot of tropes that are almost universal across all of them. For instance, many franchises have a godlike ancient alien race that starred everything, or how about planet-destroying weapons? You don't have a legitimate sci-fi universe unless you have some good old planet-cracking technology. And one of these tropes is actually parasites. From Star Wars to Stargate, there are a lot of different takes on the sci-fi parasite. And today we are going to list the most dangerous among them. In 10th place, we have the illus microorganism. Does it belong on this list? Maybe not, but you know I had to throw something in here for my Expanse Baratna, who I'm neglecting with today's video. That said, I really do think it's always worth including something from the Expanse on the list videos we do, because where everything else on the list will be somewhat overpowered, the Expanse will add a touch of realism and creativity. I want to avoid spoilers, so I don't want to say too much here, but basically Illus 4 is a planet that the crew of the Rosinante find themselves on in the fourth season of the show, where the protomolecule is active. While there, the inhabitants of the planet, which include a Belter settlement and an Earth-based research company, become infected with a green microorganism that causes what has been termed the green blindness. The organism lives within Illus's clouds and infects other species when released from the clouds in the form of water droplets that can enter through the human eye. The infection causes the host to gradually go blind over the course of a few days. What makes this parasite so deadly is that the human immune system doesn't do much to fight back against it. Rather, the human body is an environment within which the microorganism can thrive and multiply rapidly. This is why the human infection rate on Illus was nearly 100%. Additionally, when sociopaths are infected with the organism, they have been known to turn into violent zombies. The good news is that in the time the expanse takes place, a certain type of anti-cancer medication can cure and make people immune to the infection. In ninth place, I have to go with Trill symbionts, a sentient vermiform or worm-like creature native to Trill, the home planet of the eponymous Trill, a humanoid species. Trill symbionts get their name from their habitats. They lived symbiotically inside humanoid hosts. The parasite was usually surgically implanted in an individual where it then connected with the host's body. The Trill would have this procedure done because they saw it as a way to enhance themselves. There's so many possibilities when you're joined. I'm not sure what I'd do yet. I figured I'd get a lot of guidance from the symbiont. Trill symbionts could live for over 500 years and would take the memories of their previous hosts with them when entering a new host. Meaning that the new host would gain all of the memories and knowledge of all of the previous hosts. Given the symbiotic relationship at play here, you might say that these parasites aren't dangerous, but I would say that's exactly what they want you to think. It's the symbiont that gets more out of the host than the host gets out of it, given that the symbiont outlasts its host. Also, it was kind of disgusting that Worf married a Trill symbiont named Jazdia Dax. I mean, for God's sakes, he wasn't married to a woman, he was married to a worm. This relationship was not a beautiful love story, it had the makings of a TLC show. And creepiest of all, when Jazdia's symbiont was transferred to another host and became Ezri Dax, Worf made moves on her as well. All the females in the galaxy and Worf goes for the worms. Say what you want about Worf, but you can't say he doesn't have a type. In eighth place, we have the brain worm from Star Wars, a species of parasitic worm native to the planet Geonosis. The Geonosis parasite would enter host bodies through an orifice, and once inside, can completely take over the mind of its host. Even dead hosts can be controlled by the worm, as was seen during the Clone Wars when Geonosian Queen Karina the Great used the parasites to raise an undead army. 
Once a host is infected, that host then works quickly to infect other beings by way of hatching more worms, which then find the nearest bodies to use as their hosts. These worms do, however, become much easier to defeat in cold temperatures. In seventh place, we have to go back to Star Trek for the SETI eel, a creature native to the planet SETI Alpha 5. SETI eels incubate their larvae within their carapace, and when the offspring emerge, they enter into larger creatures through the ear. However, unlike some other parasites on this list, the SETI eel is not self-aware, and itself does not take control of its host. Instead, once inside a host, a SETI eel wraps itself around the cerebral cortex, rendering its host highly susceptible to suggestion from external beings. Thus, SETI eels can be used to control one's enemies. Though the suggestion effect doesn't last forever. As the larva matures in its host, the host will begin to go crazy and will eventually die. Additionally, a desert creature, the SETI eel can endure harsh environments and even survive through the orbital shift SETI Alpha 5 experienced following the explosion of SETI Alpha 4. In sixth place is the Goa'uld from Stargate. The Goa'uld are another worm-like parasite species that burrow into host bodies and wrap around the spinal cord and central nervous system. They then extend thin filaments up into the brain, at which point the parasites exert full control over their hosts. But endowing the body with increased health, strength, and intelligence. The Goa'uld might sound like other parasites on this list, but what makes them especially dangerous is that not only do they exert nearly full control over their hosts, but they also are extremely difficult to remove without damaging the host body. And even if they are removed safely using advanced surgical techniques, they are capable of releasing a deadly poison that can kill their host upon removal. Additionally, the Goa'uld race shares a collective genetic memory, which is passed down to newborn symbiotes, and thus the Goa'uld gets stronger and stronger as time goes on. In fifth place, we have the Midichlorians. It's hard to really call Midichlorians distinct organisms from their hosts, given that they have resided within the cells of all living organisms since the foundation of life, and given that they operate symbiotically within their hosts rather than destructively. Or in other words, life cannot exist without them. However, they are intelligent organisms on their own. What makes Midichlorians so dangerous is that the energy field known as the Force speaks through them. Put simply, midichlorians link organic beings with the Force. Midichlorians are a microscopic life form that resides within all living cells. They live inside me. Inside your cells, yes. And we are symbionts with them. Beings with high quantities of midichlorians in their cells are often Force sensitive and can use the Force to gain supernatural capabilities and achieve great power. So why are midichlorians dangerous? Well, if life had evolved without them, perhaps then the galaxy wouldn't have been plagued by one megalomaniacal genocidal Sith Lord after another throughout history, and the galaxy could have existed in greater peace than it has thus far. Any organism that allows for certain individuals but not others to wield magical powers is a threat to all life. In fourth place, we have Nemesis Alpha, a parasite genetically engineered by the Umbrella Corporation to combat the negative effects of the T-virus. Crap, I talked about viruses, but maybe it's okay to talk about viruses in order to talk about parasites. Well, if there are ads on this video, you know we made it. Anyway, the T-virus, designed to mutate humans into biological weapons, is known to cause brain damage and loss of intelligence in its hosts. The Nemesis Alpha parasite prevents these side effects. Transplanted into a host in its cellular stage, the self-aware parasite consumes its host's T-virus cells, allowing it to reproduce. It then invades the entire body, attaching itself to the host's spinal cord, destroying the host's brain and forming its own brain, completely transforming its host's neural network and thus improving his intelligence. A telltale sign that a host is infected with the parasite is tentacles protruding from the host, which stem from the parasite itself and can infect other beings. The parasite can also take over human zombie hosts by just latching onto the heads of their victims. Beyond improvements to intelligence, the Nemesis Alpha parasite also produces secretions which mutate any tissue exposed to it, causing the host's body to become stronger and gain regenerative abilities. The Nemesis Alpha parasite is especially dangerous when combined with Umbrella's Tyrant T103 model, a powerful genetically engineered mutant. The result of infecting the T-103s was the Nemesis T-type, also simply known as Nemesis, an impressively powerful and horrifying enemy that resembles my worst hentai nightmares. 
At number three, we have to include rippers on this list in order to avoid a surge of comments from keyboard inquisitors threatening to execute me for my heresy. Rippers are a maggot-like species of tyranid with sharp claws and powerful jaws lined with teeth sharp enough to gnaw through plasteel. Rippers are the most common form of tyranids and are responsible for consuming biomass from conquered planets in order to grow the tyranid high fleet. It's primarily rippers that have earned tyranids their reputation for swarming and stripping planets at terrifying speed. Rippers advance behind Tyranid assault forces on the battlefield using their claws and teeth to feast on wounded and dead soldiers. Those simple, mindless creatures, in large swarms, rippers can bring down creatures many times their size and strength. Even space marines are not immune. Towards the end of the battle, rippers then consume the rest of the biological material on the planet. Though seemingly somewhat of an animal, I've included rippers here because a winged Tyranid bioform known as the Parasite of Mortrax is able to use its barbed tail to implant its living victims with ripper parasite embryos. As the ripper parasites in the host mature, they devour the host from the inside out rather than from the outside in. Which brings us to our next parasite on the list. In second place, we have chestbursters, the infant form of xenomorphs, which usually resemble big worms with teeth, but their form can vary depending on the length of gestation period. Chestbursters are introduced into their hosts via facehuggers, a parasitoid form of the xenomorph. A facehugger will attach itself to a host's face and then insert its proboscis down the host's throat, which then both supplies air to the victim and implants a mutagenic fluid into their esophagus, which initiates a process by which the host cells are restructured in such a way that causes the host's body to assemble the chest burster from its own biological material. The chest burster develops within an amniotic sac attached to the host's umbilical cord, through which it can absorb the nutrients from the host that it needs to grow. During this process, the developing chestburster exchanges genetic material with its host, which leads to the resulting xenomorph sharing some characteristics with its host, and thus, all xenomorphs are genetically unique from each other and exhibit at least slightly different features and capabilities from one another, if not radically different ones. More importantly to the parasitic chestburster, this process of genetic exchange allows for the chestburster to hide itself from the host's immune system. When its development is complete, the chest burster will release enzymes that soften the bones and tissue in the host's chest cavity, and then it will violently force its way out of the host through the sternum. These alien parasites cause so many mixed feelings for their hosts, as on one hand, the chest burster's development process is kind of like pregnancy, and thus, the cute little xenomorph that emerges is technically the host's baby, which makes for a beautiful moment. On the other, after that moment is over, the host dies due to massive organ rupture and blood loss, so that's a bit of a downer. Still, chestbursters are the most adorable things you'll have to set on fire. And I mean you will have to do the honorable thing and use the flamer on them, because while they may be children, they're still aliens. And finally, in first place, you knew it was coming, we have the Flood. As far as parasites go, it's hard to outdo a species that reproduces and grows stronger by consuming sentient life. The Flood originated from the galaxy's most ancient race, the Precursors, who, long story short, were being wiped out by the Forerunners and thus transmuted the Precursors who survived into a dust, which could regenerate into their original forms at a later time when things were going a little bit better. However, the dust became corrupted, aka cocaine was invented, and started infecting life forms across the galaxy. The flood spreads by infecting an organism, taking over its host nervous system, and transforming the host into one of a variety of forms. The flood can rapidly assimilate organisms, dead or alive, meaning that as the flood rampages through worlds, its armies grow in number. The flood also shares a collective consciousness, and this hive mind absorbs the memories and intelligence of its victims. In other words, every time the flood assimilates another being, the entire flood gets smarter. And while individual flood organisms aren't sentient, when enough organisms have been assimilated into the flood, the flood becomes a grave mind, which is self-aware. This is why despite being made up of many different smaller organisms, the flood is really one giant macro-organism that thinks as a single entity. The combination of the flood's ability to assimilate mass amounts of organisms and evolve at the same time make it nearly unstoppable. So much so that in order to stop it, the Forerunners had to activate a superweapon called the Halo Array that wiped out all life in the galaxy, thus destroying the Flood's food source. Which, I don't want to pretend to be a know-it-all or something, or, or play the I told you so game, but that was what I suggested very early on in this pandemic as a way to curb the spread. But anyways, what do I know? That is the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If I missed any great parasites from science fiction, 
please do list them in the comments down below. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up. Um, subscribe to our channel. You should definitely do that. Um, hit that notification bell so you don't miss a thing. For now, my name is American Ben, and I'll catch you next time. Generation Films, peace.